This morning, as you've seen, we've been focusing on the ministry of Compassion International. This is Compassion Sunday. We've had the Compassion experience with us all weekend, an experience where you're able to walk through and kind of, at the very least in this world, get a view for another world. And so today, I want to take a break out of our series in Psalm 23, and I want you to turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, and I want to talk to you about this subject this morning, Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children. Mark chapter 10, verse 13, we'll look at to verse 16. One of the reasons that I love Compassion International, why Stephanie and I, why our family support two kids each month. We have Bianca in Peru. We have Joel in Ecuador. One of the reasons we support them is because I believe that Jesus sets the example for how we are to love the little children, all the children of the world. And I believe in what the ministry of Compassion International does. I love this short little mission statement they have as a part of their logo, releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I love that we can have a part of somebody's life in another world whom we may never meet, but we know they're getting care, medical care. They're getting food. Their needs are met, and they're hearing about Jesus Christ who loves them. And so today, as we focus on what Compassion International does, I want to focus on the life and ministry of Jesus in Mark chapter 10 regarding specifically how he felt about children. Mark chapter 10, begin reading with me in verses 13. We'll read to verse 16. The Bible says, And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them, but when Jesus saw it, He was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Remember the power is in the perfect word of God. So today, for a brief time, I want to talk to you about this subject, Jesus Loves the Little Children. You know, I've stolen the subject, the title of the message, from that very famous and popular song that many of you learned, maybe growing up in church, Jesus Loves the Little Children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight, Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World. It's a song maybe you learned when you were growing up in Sunday school. I taught our kids a new verse, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, pink and blue, Jesus loves me more than you. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's a joke, right? We know that's that's not true. Jesus loves everyone. I I heard, uh, as I was thinking about children, I heard several things. Children were writing prayers to God, and this is some of the things they wrote. Dear God, thank you for a baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. That's a joyous. Dear God, please send me a pony. I have never asked for anything before. You can look it up. This one shows a lot of love. Dear God, if we come back as something, please don't let me be Jennifer Horton because I hate her. (laughs) Dear God, I think the stapler is one of your greatest inventions. How about that? God, I bet it's very hard for you to love all of everybody in the world. There are only four people in my family, and I can never do it. (laughs) Dear God, this is Tom. Dear God, why is Sunday school on Sunday? I thought it was supposed to be our day of rest. Very interesting from the heart and lips of children. Today from Mark chapter 10, I want to talk to you about three powerful lessons that we see from the life of Jesus and specifically his ministry to children. Number one, notice in verses 13 to 14, we must lead children to Jesus. We must lead children to Jesus. Now, one of the most important jobs I have as a dad, in fact, I would say the most important job I have as a dad is to make sure that my children learn to love Jesus. 
that the most important job I have to Jake, Judd, Anna Kate, Sadie, and Caroline, all five of our kids, is to lead them into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is number one. Whether they make it big and ball or they get a scholarship to school or whether they they cure cancer or make great investments in lives and uh, impact on this world, my job as a dad, I will be a failure. I will be a failure if I fail to teach them how to love Jesus. And our job as parents and grandparents as a church is to lead people to Jesus, to lead men and women, boys and girls, into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And notice what the Bible says in verse 13. They were bringing children to Jesus. The tense of the verb in the Greek gives the indication that this was continual. This was customary. People always brought kids to Jesus. It gives the idea that something that happened all the time. They were bringing kids to to Jesus, the, the parents knew that Jesus loved their kids. The parents knew that Jesus would receive their kids, that he would pray for their kids, they would bless their kids. Can you, be, can you imagine being one of those parents that day? I would want my kids to come to Jesus. I would want them to meet Jesus. I would want Jesus to pray for my kids. Parents didn't even think twice about it. But the interesting thing is the disciples didn't like the interruption. What did they say? The Bible says the disciples rebuked them, acting as bodyguards and protectors. As parents were bringing kids to Jesus, the disciples pushed them away, rebuked them. The word rebuke is very strong. In Mark 4, Jesus used that word. He rebuked the wind and the waves, and the wind and the waves were calm. The word literally means to be muzzled, quiet down, hush, leave them alone. And the idea is if the advice is not heeded, punishment will come. The disciples said, if y'all don't get away from here, we're going to do something. Get away from Jesus. He's sending away the parents. He's sending away the children. Maybe the disciples said something like this. Can't you control your kids? Here they are interrupting our time with Jesus, and he's spending time with important people like us. Can't you control their kids? What kind of parents are you that would allow these kids to run up to Jesus while he's Teaching. Can't you see this is Jesus? He's important. He doesn't have time for little brats like your kids. He's busy with us. Quit bothering Jesus. Take take your kids to Johnny G's or the play place at Burger King, okay? We don't have time for this here. But verse 14 says, Jesus, notice this now. Jesus responds to his disciples. Look at the text, read 14. But when Jesus saw, when Jesus saw what his disciples did, He was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Jesus sees his disciples rebuking the children, and Jesus, the Bible says, is indignant at his disciples, not at the parents, not at the loud, crazy, snot-nosed kids. He's indignant at his disciples. Indignant, the word is only used here in Mark 10. In the whole Bible, this is the only place. Indignant, it means to be greatly grieved. It gives the idea of being angry and sad both at the same time. Jesus is indignant at his disciples. The disciples thought that Jesus needed protection from the kids and Jesus knows the kids need protection from the disciples. Let the children come to me. Do not push them away. Do not rebuke them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Since we have a limited window as a church, really a limited window of opportunity, we need to use our best efforts as parents, as grandparents, as a church to lead children to Jesus. A startling statistic, maybe you've heard. 83% of those who come to faith in Christ do so before the age of 18. 83%. The older a person becomes, the likelihood that he or she will become a Christian diminishes significantly. James Dobson says, we must make the salvation of our children our number one priority. Nothing else is more important. That is why as a church, Second Baptist Church, we invest so much of our resources in our student ministry and our children's ministry because we know that children and students 
are more likely to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's why we say that it matters what we do with the students and the children here at Second. That's why some of you, you're praying about where God would have you serve. You know what God, you know he's doing something in your life. You know he wants you to serve in some area. Some of you need to pray about leading, teaching, and discipling students in our student ministry. God's put that on your heart and you need to follow him in obedience and do that. That, that's why when we talk about uh, the flashlight Easter egg hunt coming up and we say, hey, we need volunteers for the flashlight Easter egg hunt. Why? Because we are investing in the lives of people who need to know Jesus. They'll hear the gospel on Friday night. Do, do you realize the flashlight Easter egg hunt? We need almost 200 volunteers to pull that event off. Almost 200 volunteers. Thousands of people come to be a part of this. Those who will hear the gospel. So today, when we're finished, I want the lobby to be so full of people picking up names for Compassion International, signing up to serve at the Flashlight Easter Egg Hunt on Friday that you can't even get out unless you sign up for something, right? I want to be so full because here's the deal. Listen, church, because if we refuse to serve in ways like this, we might as well yank up the sign and say, sorry, we can't do it. We don't have time to minister our community in this way. Jesus loves the little children. I'm telling you something. The church, this church, puts its money where its mouth is in regard to students and children because they matter. Kids matter to Jesus. They ought to matter to us. Verse 14, Jesus says, Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now, this is important. This this verse helps us to see by nature kids kids are full of faith. Kids are trusting Kids are helpless, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. I think it's important to say, Jesus doesn't say that just children belong to the kingdom of God. He says those that are like the children, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Because of the high value Jesus places on children, listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. Listen carefully. Whoever receives such one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. You think Jesus cares about kids? Absolutely. It's clear from his word. Jesus loves the little children, so so should we. D.L. Moody was preaching a revival one Sunday. Somebody said, hey, how'd it go? And he said, we had two and a half salvations. They said, two and a half? Two adults and one child. He said, no, two children and one adult. The kids had their whole life before them. The adult only had half left. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Look, I want people to get saved at any age. Amen? And I believe that. And I'm thankful no matter how old you are or young you are, no matter how far you are, how close you are, no matter where you've done, no matter what what you've done or where you've been, no matter all the mistakes you've made, Jesus can save you. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm also thankful that as a boy at 11 years old, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus. It spared me from a lot of pain and heartache later on. We ought, we ought to lead them to Jesus. And I think it's important to note something very interesting in this passage in Mark chapter 10. And I think this is an interesting, important application. So we either are leading people to him or we're pushing people away. We're either leading people to him or we're pushing people away. So which do we do as a church, as a body of Christ, as families, as neighbors, as coaches, as classmates? We are either leading people to him or we're pushing them away. Number two, notice this. We must learn from their faith in Jesus. We must lead them to Jesus. We must learn from their faith in Jesus. Let me just say something. These days, it's become a habit in church circles to condemn childlike faith. Pastors and authors make such a big deal about knowing all the answers, having it all figured out, doing all the right things, and then we can say you really know Jesus, and then we can say we'll consider you getting baptized. They require tests and classes and all sorts of stipulations, and I'm just telling you, read some books of some new pastors out there, and and they really condemn childlike faith. 
Now, I want to be honest with you. I think the church has erred on both sides. I think at some times we've pushed it so much that children aren't ready to be saved or baptized. We said, it doesn't matter. Just pray this prayer and we'll dunk you. That's not right. But I also think it is of utmost importance for us to understand Jesus never condemned childlike faith. Jesus commended childlike faith. And if we wait until somebody knows all the verses and has all the answers and has it all figured out, none of us could come to Jesus because none of us has it all figured out. And so we ought to listen carefully. Man, if you've got, if you've got a son or a daughter and they're small and they say, hey, I think I want to be baptized. I think I need to be saved. I think God might be speaking to my heart. That's not a time to say, oh, no, you're too young for that. That's a time to say, you know what? Let's sit down. Let's talk about that. They may be ready. They may not. But how do you know what God's saying to their heart? Here, Jesus doesn't condemn childlike faith. He commends it. In fact, he says it is a prerequisite to salvation. Don't push the children away. Let them come, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Look at what he says in verse 15. This is strong. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So when it comes to salvation, Jesus doesn't emphasize seminary professor theology. He emphasizes childlike faith. And he says that no one can enter the kingdom unless they come as a little child with faith. You know what? Faith, humility, helplessness, absolute and total trust. Notice what he says, for to such belong, belongs the kingdom of God. In other words, those who exemplify the qualities of a child. So in order to grow up, you've got to get young first, right? In order to be a spiritual adult, you first have to be a spiritual baby, a child. There are numerous accounts in the New Testament. 482 times in the Bible, the word children is used. But you know something interesting? Very rarely does it refer to those that might be uh, under 18 or under 12. It, it refers to the children of God. So have you ever thought about that? In relationship to God, what are we? We are His children. He is our Father. If we want to become a spiritual adult, we first must become a spiritual child. God sees us as children. And this is really, I, I believe, a side benefit to spending time with kids because you see the world through the wonder in their eyes. You ever spent time with kids and they see something for the first time and they're just like, wow. And you think, well, I've, saw, I've seen that a thousand times and it doesn't really strike me anymore. You ever, you ever seen kids who may, for the first time, they really get that Jesus loves me and Jesus died on the cross for my sins? Wow. The problem is adults have heard it so much we've lost the wonder and the amazement and the glory of the gospel story. Number three. So first of all, we need to lead them to Jesus. We need to learn from their faith in Jesus. And number three, we must love them like Jesus. Since children matter to Jesus, they must matter to us. We need to lead them to Jesus, learn from their faith, and love them like Jesus. Look at what it says now in verse 16. And he took them in his, in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, I said a minute ago, they would bring children to Jesus on a consistent basis. This would happen a lot. And every time, I believe the parents had the expectation that Jesus was going to love on their kids. He was going to spend time with them. He's going to let them know that they mattered. Now, get the picture in your mind. I want you to see this. Jesus rebukes the disciples and receives the children. Now, I don't think this was like Jesus just, uh, you know, the kids run up to Jesus and he's just like, hello, little one. You know, I don't think he did that. I, I don't. I, I think Jesus got down with them. I think he's, he sat down on the ground or a rock or a stump and said, hey, come here. And he put them on his knee. 
I, I think he'd, he'd pick them up and hug them and say, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Jesus loved them, not just with words, but with his actions. He got down in the dirt with them. He received them and welcomed. The Bible says he blessed them. In Jewish culture, the blessing of a father to a child was everything. Read the Old Testament about the blessing. Here's something interesting. Jesus receives all the children. In the Jewish culture, it's only reserved for the males in the family. Jesus says, look, everybody can be blessed. Everybody's welcome. Everybody can come. Let all the little children come. Can I just say that when Jesus came to where you were, he got down and got dirty. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. He met you right where you were and it didn't matter where you were from or the mistakes that you'd made, male or female, how much money you had or all of your accomplishments or all of your failures. He loved you and welcomed you and accepted you right where you were. That's the kind of God that we serve. The Bible says he blessed them. He took them in his arms. He laid his hands on them. Now, in my house growing up, to lay hands on a child meant something different than this verse means. Whenever I knew that hands were about to be laid on me, it was not a good thing. And in our house now, when, when the kids know that hands are about to be laid on them, there's fear and trepidation. But in this context, it means that Jesus is conferring a blessing. He reaches out and touches them in love and grace. By the way, <laughs> He loved you when you were unlovable. He touched you when you were untouchable. He reached you when you were unreachable. He saved you when you were unsavable. When the enemy says, you're through, Jesus reaches down and touches you and welcomes you. He loved them. And we need to as well. Every little boy, little girl, I've told you this before, I'd rather have crayon marks on the walls than cobwebs in the corners. I would rather need to buy new carpet than wonder, when are children going to show up at this place? I'd rather have to, I would rather have to build a new building than fuss at kids for bumping something or messing something up. This is a place where ministry happens and sometimes it's messy, but we love them to Jesus. That's what matters. We don't just love the ones in this building. We love the ones who aren't here yet. We love the ones who are our neighbors, and we love the ones across the nations. This is why I love compassion, because we're able to make an investment in a little girl's life, a little boy's life, people we've never met, although we've written letters and received cards and drawings and stories. We're able to make an investment. I heard a story about, this was years ago. Years ago, dad sat in the waiting room while the moms were in the maternity ward. Heard about three dads that were in the waiting room, waiting to hear a word about their, their new additions. The nurse walks into one of them and says, hey, congratulations, it's twins. The dad said, wow, that's amazing coincidence. I work for the Minnesota Twins. Great. Next, nurse walks into the next guy and says, hey, guess what? Triplets. He said, whoa, triplets, are you kidding me? What a coincidence. I work for the 3M Corporation. Just then, another guy that was sitting there fell out on the floor and put his hand on his head. He said, are you okay? Are you sick? He goes, I'm not sick. I'm just worried. I work for the 7-Up Corporation. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a blessing? You know, the Bible tells us that children are a blessing from the Lord. Children are a blessing. Why is it then that our society treats them like a burden? When I tell people that I have 
my wife and I have five children. Very rarely do we hear, wow, what a blessing, congratulations. Most of the time we hear, what in the world is wrong with you? So what we've done is we have ascribed the status of burden to what God says is a blessing. Children are a blessing from the Lord. We ought to treat them as such. We ought to take those blessings and train them and lead them. Let me finish here. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows of their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 27, and this should answer it for all of us. When it comes to blessing the children and loving the children like Jesus, the ministry of Compassion International, listen to what it says, Proverbs three twenty-seven: Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. How can we spend so much money on things that we don't need to impress people we don't like when all around the world there are people who don't know where their next meal is coming from and many have never heard of the name Jesus. Compassion partners with a local church And feeds them physically so they can feed them spiritually. I love this mission statement. This is what it says. Compassion International. In response to the Great Commission, Compassion International exists to advocate for children, to release them from their spiritual, economic, social, and physical poverty, and enable them to become responsible and fulfilled Christian adults. You can make a difference. Stephanie already told me when we were on the front row, she's picked out another one for us. So maybe we'll have as many compassion children as we have biological children one day. Why withhold good to those to whom it's due when it's in your power to do good?